Mark Inc. Ministries presents the preaching and teaching of Dr. Chuck Betters of Glasgow Church in Bear, Delaware. This sermon is part of the In His Grip series that can be found along with other various resources by visiting our website at markinc.org. That's www.markinc.org. Psalm 119 and Proverbs chapter 5. This is the third in a series of messages that deal with the specific sin of adultery. Now, you may be sitting there thinking to yourself, I would never, ever commit adultery. I love my spouse too much, and for that reason, this sermon and this message seems to be uh, unnecessary for me. But may I suggest to you that there are different kinds of adultery. There is the physical act, which all of us are aware of, but there is something that God refers to in Scripture as a spiritual adultery as well. In fact, the very book of Hosea, that Old Testament prophecy book, was written specifically to illustrate in the life of Hosea and his wife Gomer and her unfaithfulness to him, the relationship that Israel had with God. And God calls them an adulterous nation. Beyond that, I believe that one of the things we need to readily deal with in the church is the fact that there are sins that lead up to the physical act of adultery. We tend to think that we have not committed adultery if we have not had a physical, intimate relationship with another person outside of marriage. But I believe the act of adultery, Jesus taught us, is committed first in the mind. And that as we turn from certain things in our lives and move toward the actual act of adultery, the sin has already been committed. And so Jesus referred to an adultery of the mind. The fact that we sin because we lust after one another. It's interesting if you were to study the Song of Solomon, that in the Song of Solomon there are cultural words that properly understood in that culture, if translated into our culture today and read in this meeting, it probably would embarrass you. The graphic language that Solomon uses to describe the physical relationship between he and his wife, when you decode, so to speak, all of those cultural symbols, they become very specific and very detailed and very graphic. Now, I tell you that in order to say this. It seems as though in Christian churches today, we don't want to talk about something that is an integral part of who we are. It simply seems to us to be inappropriate. We just want to talk about how lovely Jesus is and what a wonderful thing it is to follow after him. Yet he made us as physical, sexual, emotional, and spiritual beings. We are created in his image and his likeness. And just as I shared with you a couple of weeks ago, it is Satan's design to take those very natural appetites that God says is good create certain weak spots whereby we can fail or fall and then tempt us in that weakness in order to take what is good and create out of it something that is evil. That is Satan's MO and it has always been his MO. When we talk about being created in the image and likeness of God, we mean by that that God is a moral being as we are, a relational being, an immortal being as we are, and that as such, we need to look at the Godhead that exists in us and celebrate those things that model who he is in each of us. You see, like God, man is a relational being, and moral temptations must be fought as we deal with interpersonal relationships that we have with our spouses and with other people. Moral failure often occurs when we focus upon fulfilling in an unnatural way natural fleshly desires that are God-given. We all have appetites. 
But every appetite that you have and that I have is designed to drive us to Christ, to absolute dependence upon him in order to fulfill those appetites with himself. You say, well, what do you mean by that? We need food. But he is the bread of life. The physical food we need and the bread of life we need are paralleled in the scriptures. We need pleasure. God created us for pleasure. God created us for rest, for recreation, for enjoyment of what life gives us. But he is the one alone who can satisfy. None of those other pleasures will ever bring you the satisfaction that faith in Christ will and can bring you. That is why when we talk about mere physical appetites, they can never bring you lasting happiness. They do not last. In fact, that's the very definition of the word lust, something that is never satisfied. They can never meet the deep internal longings of the soul that are designed to be filled by none other than the Holy Spirit of the living God and his abiding presence. That is why when you teach your children to look to the outward appearance, you are setting them up for moral failure. Some parents seem to be raising their kids to accentuate their physical beauty. It seems as though some moms and some dads are bent on living their lives, perhaps even their moral lives of failure, in and through their children and their outward beauty or outward giftedness. So our children are seen wearing makeup at six and flashy clothes and a wardrobe that seems to change with every passing fad. While dad sits in his car and whistles at girls and gawks at pretty women, and dating seems to become an exercise in parental pride. It seems to become more about you than it is about your children. Yet that same child rarely will see mom and dad in some sort of physical expression of love with a hug or a kiss or some playfulness or some teasing. They are taught early on that outward beauty is the key to contentment. The more beautiful they are, the more contented they think they will be, only to discover that they must interact in relationships with other people who are not at all impressed with what they physically look like. You see, ladies, you see, men, no matter how beautiful or handsome you think you have become, and some of us need to take a look at ourselves before we think that, no matter how much you think you physically arrived, there is always going to be another woman more attractive than you. And there is always going to be a man more handsome than you. Lust is never satisfied. It seems as though we cannot turn on the TV without some sort of sexual innuendo. We are living today in probably the most liberal and sexual culture we have ever known in our society. We're looking at ads on televisions now, TV sets, when we are watching a football game or a basketball game, suddenly there is somebody who appears on the screen in order to inspire us to moral failure. We're seeing controversies develop almost every year over what kind of ads will be aired during the Super Bowl. I've seen some of these ads. They belong in some sleazy a studio somewhere where porn is being produced, and yet they are going to be the very things your children either will see immediately or will see at some point. You and I are living in a sexually driven culture, and it seems as though the church is silent. When I study, for example, the divorce rates, staggering statistics boggle my mind, even cause me a bit of depression. I read recently through the Barna Research Group that the divorce rate in the world compared to that of evangelical Christianity, which is defined by nine theological criteria, and those criteria fit us. So we're talking about our people. Evangelical, Christian, born-again people who truly adhere to basic doctrines that make us who we are are compared to 
to the rest of the world who do not believe in those doctrines. And we are finding staggeringly that the statistics of divorce in the church rival those of the world. In fact, one of the most disappointing statistics that I read recently is that the divorce rate in evangelical Christianity is roughly 29%. The divorce rate among atheists and agnostics is 21%. It seems as though morally speaking and in terms of behavior, they understand things that we ought to understand. Ought the statistics to be that way? Ought you and I to be talking about how embarrassing it is for us as evangelical Christians to know about our own personal moral failures in maintaining the integrity of marriage, the sanctity of the bed, and teaching our children to do likewise? James chapter 5 teaches us that there is a specific way in which we are to handle temptation. Psalm 119 teaches us that we are to hide the word of God in our hearts so that we might be able to use that word to speak to any moral temptation you and I might be experiencing. It's not just a matter of quoting scripture. It's a matter of meditating in God's word to the point that the word becomes so much an integral part of who you are that when something stares you in the face that is morally questionable, the word of God just sticks out like a sore thumb. In James chapter 4, beginning with verse 5, it says, Do you think the scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely? But he gives more grace. Listen to this. That is why the scripture says, God opposes, and by the way, you can put in parentheses beside that word opposes, these words, to treat as an enemy, because that's the literal translation. God treats as an enemy the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, he doesn't leave us there. He says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Obviously, the question becomes, how do we resist the devil? When faced with moral failure, what is it that God wants us to do in order to resist the devil? You'll notice in the following verses in James 4, he says, Come near to God, and he will come near to you. The only way, the only way you can adequately resist moral failure and resist satanic attack is by drawing near or coming near unto God. You say, well, how do I do that? You do that, according to Psalm 119, by building his word into your heart. Specifically, that is how Jesus dealt with temptation, isn't it? Did he not, when he heard Satan quote, or should I say misquote, in sort of half-truth ways, the scriptures? Satan quoted the Bible. But he quoted it in the wrong way. He only gave part of the picture. He twisted verses out of context. But Jesus knew the word. He knew what the word really said. So he was able to hear that false interpretation of the word, and it stuck out to him like a sore thumb. And when Satan would say something like, didn't God say, Jesus would then turn around and finish the sentence. And he would use scripture to resist the devil. He being the perfect and infinite God-man and the template by which you and I are to resist evil ought to give us ample evidence at this point how we are to resist moral temptation. We are to build the word into our hearts. We are to meditate so much upon the principles of Scripture that when faced with moral temptation, we are not walking into it with blinders. That is why when we read the first nine chapters of Proverbs, the fathers and the mothers were considered failures as parents if they had not raised their children by the time they were 12 years of age to understand the principles of those early chapters of Proverbs, specifically the first nine. And in Proverbs chapter 5, 
In Proverbs chapter 7, specific direction is given by the parents to the children as to how they are to face moral temptation. It also deals with the consequences of failing. You see, we must learn to deal with temptation because we are created in the image and likeness of God, morally speaking. We are moral creatures, and we must face temptation with moral convictions. You see, Satan is a master at highlighting the grace of God. Oh, I'm saved by God's grace. God has forgiven me of all of my sins, past, present, and future. Yet many of us have what I like to call the spirit of Shimei. You remember that story about Shimei? When David was on his way to the throne, he comes across this man who was a partner, if you will, or a supporter of those who opposed David. And he stands along the side of the road as David and his troops are coming in. And he begins to curse and blaspheme. He begins to yell and scream at him, cursing obscenities at him. One of David's aides stands beside him and says, why are you listening to this? Let me go over and cut this scoundrel's head off. And David said, no, put up your sword. Some of what he's saying is true about me. And he reprieves Shimei. Now, when David had achieved the victory, Shimei was in hot water. Because now he is a known and sworn enemy of David. Yet David, by grace and mercy, brings Shimei into a state whereby Shimei is protected by David's own law. But David warns him, here are the boundaries in which you must live. This is the grace I have extended to you. You ought to be killed. But I am giving you grace. I am extending to you mercy, and you must live within these specific boundaries. Time goes by. Shimei obeys and follows the directions of David. And he lives within those boundaries until one day, something comes up and Shimei reasons, well, it's gone good so far. Things have gone well thus far. Maybe I can compromise a little. Maybe I can go where I'm not supposed to go. After all, David has extended grace to me, and he will extend grace to me again. This is what I call the presumptive spirit that many of us have when it comes to abusing the grace of God. Presumptuous sin, presuming upon the grace of God, the end of the story, of course, is that in abusing God's grace, Shimei lost his life. David and his followers ended up having him killed because of his recalcitrance. And as you and I sit here today, we presume upon the grace of God. We think we can abuse that grace, go places, do things, act in certain ways, be with certain people in inappropriate ways, that somehow or another God is going to wink at all of that. We live presumptuously, acting as though simply because we have been forgiven, that God somehow or another will overlook our moral failure. Instead, what happens many times, and this is hard for us as Christians to comprehend, many times God takes his own children his own Christian children, those who love him yet have fallen into presumptuous sin and delivers them over to that sin so that they might feel the weight of his judgment and, yes, even destruction. We cannot have the spirit of Shimei. The spirit of Shimei is a presumptuous spirit, and that is exactly the spirit that Satan seeks to build in us highlighting, magnifying for us the grace of God. But you see, moral failure is what drives us to the grace of God. We see when faced with moral temptation, God's grace when we resist, when we draw nigh unto God, when we implement his word. And we need that grace, not just for today, but moment by moment, present grace, future grace, whereby we are drawn into his presence as we have to deal 
with the heat of moral failure and moral temptation. You see, God wants us to see the eternal consequences of disobedience. Because like God, created in his image, we are also eternal creatures. We are driven and must be driven to see eternally the consequences of the actions that we take. This is what Proverbs chapter 5, if you're there now, look at verse 7. It says, now then, my sons, listen to me. Do not turn aside from what I say. Keep to a path far from her. Do not go near the door of her house. Here is a parental urgency. Here is a dad on his knees begging his child to hear what he has to say. Here is a parent trying to keep his child from the edge of the precipice. In the next few verses, the Spirit of God tracks out for us the consequences of committing adultery. Look at how these consequences become increasingly more painful. Verse 9, he says, lest you give your strength to others. That word for strength is the word honor. Lest you give your honor to others. For you see, there is nothing honorable about claiming to love one person and then deliberately hurting that person by delivering them a devastating blow. Let it be heard here now and forever sealed in your mind. It is impossible to biblically love two women at the same time as wives or vice versa as husbands. You cannot sit there and claim you're in love with two people. You cannot cause one to morally fail and say that you love them. So if you are involved with a young man and you get involved sexually with him, you can't say that you love him and cause him to morally fall because of you. I cannot be married to my wife and say that I love her and carry on an affair with someone else whom I also claim I love. To love someone means that you would never ever do anything that would somehow alienate them from the love and the peace that comes from Jesus Christ. And he who cheats with you will also cheat on you. Why? Because they've already proven they're distrustful. When we speak of spiritual adultery, we have the same principle at heart. You can't say you love Jesus and you love the world. Didn't he make that clear? Didn't he say you cannot love me and the world at the same time? It's going to cause you to react to one or the other. You're either going to embrace one and reject the other, or you're going to reject this one and embrace the other. You cannot say you love God and mammon. There is no such thing as that kind of love. So let's eliminate once and for all the myth that you can be in love with two women at the same time while you are a married man or a married woman. Let's eliminate it once and for all that that kind of love is a secular love. It's an eros love. It's an erotic love. But it is certainly not an agape love. Look again at verse 9. You'll see that also the consequences are the loss of years to the cruel. You know what that means? You can never recapture these moments. It's like a word that you've spoken. And you know as soon as you've spoken it that you shouldn't have said that. It's out there. It's traveling at the speed of sound. And it's going to hit the ears of the person you never intended to hurt. But by the time you say the word, it's already been done. The damage has already been created. You can't take it back. Likewise, it is with the sin of adultery. You can never recapture these moments. Satan, not love, is the driving force behind every adulterous act. What could have been had in your life if you had not fallen? You see, you can never be blessed as you could have been. There's always going to be something missing in your life. You are now damaged goods. And no matter how much grace you think God has given you, that will always be with you.
It will always be on your husband's mind when he is in the bedroom with you, knowing you had been with another man. It is always going to be on your wife's mind when she knows you have shared something intimately with someone else that belonged exclusively to her. And yes, he or she may forgive you. And he or she, the two of you, may be able to recreate a relationship that is honoring and pleasing to God. But like that word, wrongly spoken, it will always be there with you. You will have lost the years because of the cruelty. There is nothing that slices the nerve of a marriage more than the sin of adultery. We can recover from just about anything else, but recovering from the sin of adultery is the most difficult, if not impossible, thing to do. Look at verse 10. Lest strangers feast on your wealth. Now, by the way, there's more wealth in your family than you realize. We're not simply talking about money. There are so many riches of family life that can never be reclaimed. It's like the drunk who is pouring out his life into a bottle. Things are wasting away around him or around her. There are many unsearchable riches in Christ that are lost forever. There is so much broken trust that will spill over into every area of your life. There is the loss of self-worth. How could I have done this? How could I have sinned this great sin against my God? How could I have hurt my spouse this way? There is also the loss of family value that can never be retrieved. And that's why he says in verse 10, and your toil enriches another man's house. He means by that there is bondage and moral failure. The cover-up, the lies, the need for more adventure the masks that have to be worn in order to preserve the image, and yes, even the sacred trust of your kids. How could your children ever trust anything you say when you have so violated the trust between you and your spouse and ultimately between you and your God? And yes, as hard as this is to comprehend, your act of adultery, your act of moral failure, has now planted a seed of moral failure in your children. Because the Bible tells us the sins of the parents are visited to the third and the fourth generations. You have planted, you have sown the seeds of adultery and divorce and moral failure in your children by your own failure. This is what he means when he talks about your toil enriching another man's house. You've lost honor. And you've lost integrity. Verse 11, there's a consumption that slowly but surely brings even the body to the grave. At the end of your life, you will groan when your flesh and your body are spent. I don't have to tell you about sexually transmitted diseases and things like that, but there's a greater death than physical death. There is a spiritual death because, you see, the Bible says the wages of sin is always death. There's an emotional death. Those of you who have experienced this know exactly what I'm talking about. There's a hollowness in your eyes. You've been hit so hard, and it's become so painful that you're just simply staring off into space. You're surviving. You're just maintaining. You're under the circumstances because your family has died. The family as it ought to be has died. And yes, even physical death comes as the result of these kinds of moral failures. Verse 12 and 13, there's a death that comes from the sting of a tormented conscience. Because after the fact, here is what happens. You will say, how I hated discipline. How my heart spurned correction. I would not obey my teachers or listen to my instructors. Instructors, you were warned. You sat here and listened to sermons. You read books. You listened to tapes. And even before you came to faith in Jesus Christ, you knew there was something vastly immoral and vastly destructive about the act of adultery. 
You didn't even need the Holy Spirit to convince you of that. Your own conscience convicted you that it was wrong. Yet you come to faith in Christ. You trust in him and in him alone for your salvation. How tormented a conscience that becomes for years to come. Psalm 51 is David's expression of this. Isn't it? Here is the man who sees a woman, beautiful woman. He desires to have her. His glands take over. He was where he should not have been. He has an affair with her. She becomes pregnant. He covers this up with a murderous act against Uriah, her husband. When confronted with this, he has to pay the price in the loss of one of his children. God rightly deals with him through Nathan the prophet. He's confronted with his own sin, and years later, he writes Psalm 51, and what does he say? Yes, God has forgiven me. I understand that forgiveness, but my sin is ever before me. What a stupid man I was. My sin is ever before me. And then verse 14, I have come to the brink of utter ruin in the midst of the whole assembly. You know what this is? You hurt the rest of the church when you morally fall. We are that whole assembly. The church is only as strong as the families that make up that church. And the families of that church are only as strong as they hold to moral conviction based upon the word of God and their love for Christ. When you fall, you hurt us. You drag us down. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Your moral failure has an effect upon the rest of the body. You say, how do you know that? Look at the statistics. We're acting just like the world. Just like the world. Evangelical Christianity that claims its belief in the inerrancy of Scripture fundamentally, in large degrees, are unwilling to follow the moral precepts of God's Word. It causes preachers like me, when we read statistics like that, to say, is anybody listening? Is it making any difference? Do you go to the same places, do the same things, act in the same way, dress the same way, talk the same way? Do you violate the Ephesians passage which says there should not even be a hint of immorality in your life? What do you watch? What is coming into your home? What are you permitting to take place? Oh, you may not be an adulterer, and you may have some sort of smugness about that. You may look at that and say, you know what? I've done pretty good. I've not cheated on my husband, or I've not cheated on my wife. But there's several kinds of adultery. There is the moral, the, the, the emotional and mental form of adultery that most of us have to face almost every day of our lives. I just came back from our marriage retreat, and I shared with the women that are sitting there, I said, you know, every time we men get together in a Bible study, small group, or wherever we are, inevitably the men want to talk about how do I handle moral temptation. And I said to the women sitting there, for the most part, now I know there are exceptions, but they're very rare, and I'll say it right here, for the most part, the man who is sitting beside you right now, your husband, your son, your father, whoever that person might be, inevitably, almost on a daily basis, is being sexually and morally tempted. And to say otherwise is to lie. Somehow or another, we just don't want to get that out on the table. Wives don't want to hear it. Husbands don't want to admit it. Churches don't want to talk about it. And so we go underground. And we begin to morally fail in subtle ways. Little ways. Venial sins, like the Catholics would say. Not the big ones, not the big mortal sins, but the little sins. Which, by the way, has no credence in Scripture. It's another story. I read something recently, an article adapted from Money, Sex, and Spiritual Power by Keith Drury. It was published in 1992 by Wesley Press. I found this to be intriguing because... It's the actual cases, counseling cases, of men and women who were, who were now exposing their adulterous affairs. 
So the quotes I'm about to quote for you are coming from actual Christian cases, people sitting in Christian counseling who are using these kinds of terms, making these kinds of statements. I call this the anatomy of adultery because you see, that's exactly what it is. It starts one way, it ends another way. It starts with what we might call the venial ways, and it ends with what we would call the mortal ways. And along that trek, there are some interesting things that take place. You might want to take notes on this, because the first step in this anatomy of adultery is two people share common interests. That's how it starts. Listen to these quotes. He was so spiritually minded. I'd been looking for someone to share my spiritual struggles with. We both shared a burden for the church and especially children's work. Secondly, we have the mental comparisons with your mate. Quotes like this, my husband wasn't interested much in spiritual things, but this man knew so much about the Bible. She was slim, attractive, and dressed sharp. Quite a difference from my wife, who didn't take care of herself much at that time. She was so understanding and would listen to me in my hurts. My wife was always so busy and rushed that we never had time to talk. My husband just would never communicate. He'd come home from work and just sit there watching TV. I finally gave up on him. Then this man came along who was worlds apart from my husband. He was gentle. He loved to talk and would just share little things about his life with me. Then we move from mentally comparing our spouses to meeting emotional needs in each other. Listen to what they say. He understood how I was feeling, and he offered me the empathy I was hungering for. Or she was there when I needed her. My ego was so starved for affirmation that I would have taken it from anyone. I guess that's what started the whole thing. Or... No one ever really believed in me until he came along. He encouraged me, inspired me, believed so deeply in what I could become. Or, my wife was busy with the kids and not at all involved in my work. This girl admired me and treated me like I was really somebody. It felt so good. Then we moved to looking forward to being together. I used to dread going to work, but after we started our friendship, I would wake up thinking of how I would see him later that day. It seemed to make getting up a little bit easier. I would think of being with her the whole time I was driving to work. Or I found myself thinking of him as I got dressed each morning, wondering how he would like a certain outfit or perfume. Or... I looked forward to choir practice every week because I knew he would be there. Or every time I drove by her house, I would think of her and how we'd see each other that Sunday. Then we moved to tinges of dishonesty with my mate. Little lies. When my wife would ask if she was with the group, I'd pretend I couldn't remember. Right there, I started building a wall between us. I would act like I was going to practice with our ensemble, but actually I was practicing a duet with him. Once my wife asked about her, but I denied everything. After all, we hadn't done anything wrong yet. Oh, yes, you had. Now I see that this was one of those exit points where I could have come clean and got off the road I was speeding down. Or... Whenever we got together as couples, I would act like I didn't care about him. And afterward, I would even criticize him to my husband. I guess I was trying to hide my real feelings from my husband. Then we moved to flirting and teasing. I could tell from the way she looked at me. She would gaze directly into my eyes, then glance down my body, then back into my eyes again. I knew then that she was interested in more than my friendship but I was so flattered by her interest that I couldn't escape. Then we started teasing each other, 
often with double meaning kinds of things. Sometimes we would tease each other even when we were together as two couples. It seemed innocent enough at first, but more and more we knew it really did mean something to us. We would laugh and talk about how it seemed like we were made for each other. Then we tease each other about, well, what kind of husband or wife would the other one have made if we married each other? He had those killer eyes. When he'd look at me in that special way, I would just melt. It was hopeless fighting my urges. He had me. Then we moved to talking about personal matters, emotional matters. We talk about things, not big things, just little things, which he cared about or I was worried about. We'd meet each other for coffee before church and just talk together. I was having problems with my son, and she seemed to understand the whole situation so much better than anyone else I talked with. I'd tell her about the most recent blow-up, and she would understand so well. We just became really deep friends, almost soulmates. That's what's so weird about all of this. We never intended it to go that far. We spent so much time together at work that I swear she knew more about me than my wife ever did or cared to know. I was so lonely since my husband died and hungry for someone to share my life with. Then he began to call just because he cared. I loved hearing his caring voice at the other end of the line, even though I knew he was a married man. Then we moved to minor yet arousing touches, squeezes, or hugs. He never touched me for months. Then one night after working late, we were walking toward the door when he said, you're so special. Thank you for all you do. Then he turned and he hugged me tenderly, just for a second. I loved how I felt for that moment so much that I began to replay it over and over again in my mind like a videotape. Now I know that I should have stopped it right there and then. I never intended to ruin my family like this. The first time she touched me was when we were doing registrations at church together. We were sitting beside each other. I'd say something cute or funny and she would giggle. Then under the table she'd squeeze the top of my leg with her hand. That really excited me. Here is a pastor who also morally fell. This is what he says. Every time she shook hands with me at the door, she seemed to linger, sort of holding my hand more than shaking it. No one else would notice, but I knew there was more to her touch than appeared to the eyes, and she knew it too. Then come the special notes and the gifts. I would sometimes call him and leave a short message on his answering machine. He would leave little notes in my Bible. He would buy me a little gift, not that expensive, but it always showed he had taken extra thought to get exactly what I liked. Of course, everyone else thought he was just being a good boss. Then we invent excuses to call or to meet. I would wait until the end of the workday, then I'd call him just before closing time about something I'd made up as a business question, and we'd talk. We started meeting more often. She started arranging her schedule so that her husband dropped her off at committee meetings. I would hang around and offer to take her home, acting with as much nonchalance as I could muster up. Then we start arranging secret meetings. We started arranging to work evenings on the same night, and then we would leave early and meet each other in the dark parking lot. She would sometimes call me just before lunch, and we'd sneak to the drive up together and then spend the rest of my lunch hour talking quietly to each other in the car. Then there is the deceit and the cover-ups. Once we were meeting secretly, I had to invent all kinds of stories about where I'd been to satisfy my wife. By now I had built a towering wall of dishonesty between us. I joined several groups so that I would have an excuse to be away in the evenings. She would ask when I'd gotten off work, I'd simply lie about it, and she never knew what hit her. How will I ever be able to regain her trust again? By now, my whole life was a lie, so I began telling them regularly to cover up our little meetings. Then there is the kissing and the embracing. Once we started meeting secretly, the end came fast. 
We kissed and hugged like two teenagers going parking for the first time. It felt so good to be hugged and loved by somebody who really cared about me. And then there is the petting and the sexual indiscretions. At this point, my glands took over. I forgot reason altogether and was willing to risk everything for more. I was like a teenager again, going too far, then repenting and promising to do better. Then just as quick, I was hungrily seeking more sin. When my husband and I were dating, we struggled with how far to go. Well, here I was again, struggling with how far to go. Friendships with this guy didn't seem so wrong. But now we were going further than I ever intended. But somehow I felt curiously justified going exactly as far as I had with my husband when we had been dating. And then finally, there is sexual intercourse. Soon I quit resisting and was swept right into outright adultery. One thing led to another, and finally we ended up in bed with each other. Though we never intended to go that far, we eventually went all the way in a sexual relationship. One night, we couldn't seem to stop ourselves. At least we didn't want to. So I completed my journey of unfaithfulness to my husband and had sex with this man. These are actual Christian people sitting face to face with pastors and counselors, telling them along this spectrum of failure, what happened along the way? When did the sin begin? When did these sins begin? The moment they made the turn. The moment they moved in this direction, adultery already occurred. It's not when you come to the end, it's when you make the turn. You've already committed the adultery with her or with him. May God give us mercy and grace to stand morally in an increasingly sexual and liberal world. May your children be protected by that same grace. And may God extract from each of us the spirit of Shimei, that presumptuous spirit. And may in his grace and mercy, he preserve us from his own judgment so that we might be morally found clean before him and able to present to our children a legacy of faith, a legacy of moral purity that will bring them into glory unashamedly with marriages that have honored and glorified the name of Jesus Christ. This program has been brought to you by Mark Inc. Ministries, proclaiming the truth that God is sovereign and you can trust him. Please visit us online at markinc.org to learn about other available sermons and resources.